I think another reason people don't do it is fear. Fear that they'll say the wrong thing, fear that they don't know how to do it, fear of hearing the words no from their clients, fear that they'll hear something they don't like. Because if you're having an honest conversation, you will learn things that are not flattering. And and it hurts in the moment, but it's certainly, it's important to, to keep growing. Welcome to episode seven of season six of Live in the Feast. I'm Jason, aka Rez, helping you grow your business by having a conversation with someone who's been there, had success, and built a business design around the life they want to live. That's Live in the Feast. If this is your first time listening, hit that subscribe button so that you get notified every time a new episode drops. Live in the Feast is in your podcast app of choice. If you've already heard the show before, then why not leave a review on iTunes or drop us a comment in Breaker or CastBox. Today's co-host is Joel Klecki. Joel was suggested to me by a number of different people, including some of you, dear listeners. So I was stoked to be able to bring him on and ask him some of the questions around not just copywriting and case studies, but how to leverage them during sales and beyond. In this episode, we dive into how conversion copywriting is not manipulating, it's not creating desire, it's actually creating a channel to your service. We also talk about the five things we try to understand about our customers and then how you make that useful. Also, how you can actually interview your customers for a case study and then use those case studies in all stages of your business to position the value of your services. So this is a great one. So why don't I just shut up and let's dive in. Hey, Feasters, welcome to another episode of Living the Feast. I'm here with Joel Klecki. He's a sought after conversion copywriter for SaaS and B2B, where he's helped clients like HubSpot, WP Engine turn more visitors into customers. He's also the founder of Case Study Buddy, who are the case study specialist. Joel, welcome. Yeah, thank you. So you're the man when it comes to conversion copywriting and well, case studies as well, obviously, but (laughs) being able to leverage those case studies and position them in such a way that sells your value or your client's value however you write in the case studies. But if that's okay with you, I'd, I'd love to dive in today and chat a little bit more about how copywriting and specifically conversion copywriting positions you and aligns your pricing with prospective customers. Is that cool? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. So to reset everything, what really is conversion copywriting? So conversion copywriting, I think a lot of people think of it a lot of different ways. For some people, it's like black magic voodoo manipulation. You know, it's it's spinning words to try to get people to do stuff they otherwise wouldn't. And I think while there is certainly a degree of let's let's say manipulation to what I do, it's it's never negative manipulation. My goal as a conversion right. copywriter is basically to help my clients understand their clients so much that they can preempt the anxieties they have, the pains they have, the desires that they have, so that we can know what to say and how to say it to help those people make an informed decision. So it's not about getting them to do something they shouldn't do or they don't want to do. It's about helping them clearly see the value in an offer, whether that offer is a download, a sign up, a purchase, whatever that might be. It's helping the right people understand what they need to understand in order to make a decision and move forward. Right. And and that's the thing too. It's like, you know, I laugh sometimes when I come across these old school, long sales, copywriting, you know, or copywritten like pitches, if you will. And sometimes it's like, I look at that and like, you just read a couple of paragraphs and you're like, oh man, how did the heck, who wrote this stuff? Like, <laughs> but like, I think it's come full circle where it's like, and, and I've said this before on the show is that I feel like nowadays people want more of that human element to the engagement that they have online with their brands, with vendors, with whoever they're engaging with. But you said that you never 
completely manipulating somebody in the wrong way, or essentially you're not manipulating somebody, you're just conveying a message to somebody in, in a way that helps convert them to the next step. How do you do that effectively? Yeah, I think it starts by understanding like your job isn't to create desire, right? It, it's not my job to create desire. My job is to channel it, to channel whatever that person already feels and knows and wants and understand. And basically my job is kind of like jujitsu, right? I, I'm trying to take all the momentum they have and direct it towards something. So the way you do that, I, I kind of mentioned, you know, previously, you have to understand these people, not on a surface level, not like chalk outline, like personas tend to be these chalk outlines we wish people fit into where it's like, okay, we sit around a board table or, you know, staff table, we make them up. We're like, well, it's, it's Judy, the soccer mom who drives a Prius and yada. yada. We, we spit this stuff out in hopes that that's who people are. But to do this effectively, there's a quote from Joanna Weeb that's basically 90% of conversion copywriting isn't writing. Only about 10%, that's, that's the output. But to know what to write and how to write it, it's pretty much all analysis and research. So what you do, there's a lot of conversations and those conversations take different forms. Sometimes we're running a customer survey and we're asking them about their experience. What was life like before? What was life like during the experience of this product or service? And then what is life like after? Other times we're having conversations with, you know, interviews where we go deep or we're doing things like on-site polls. Other times we're just observing. So we might use tools like heat mapping software or recorded user sessions to see, well, how do people engage with what's there? And not just surface level things like, well, do they scroll through it or, or do they, you know, what we're looking at is where do they stop? What do they pay attention to? What thing that we know they're looking for are they missing, right? Because I promise you, if you want to be humbled, take something you think is well designed or well written, put it online, put recording software on it, and watch people engage with it, and you'll just be devastated by how nobody <laughs> operates the way you expect. So, what to do that right? It's about having these structured conversations with people where you're digging into their experience. And what you're trying to learn is not just who they are, but what motivates them in that context. How much do they know? What is it they hope to get out of it? What are they afraid of? What are they trying to get rid of? And that sort of thing. So lots of research, lots of conversations. And once you know that stuff, then it's about putting it together in a conversational way that leads somebody through a natural conversation with your page. Even if it's, you know, at the time one sided them reading, it's really a two way dialogue. Hmm. Yeah, it's funny that you say that heat map, like for me and as a developer, and I work in the basically e-commerce space, which I just translate to anybody that's putting money through a website, um, heat map is, and scroll mapping and like all of those other kind of tools are, are so effective for me to, to say, hey, let's put this in the wild. Let's see who's doing what and clicking on what and looking at what, and then we'll adjust it accordingly. I did that to myself in my own site. And I noticed that like, even in my navigation over a course of three months, no person clicked on one of my navigation elements. And I was like, all right, let's remove it and put something else up there. Right. Because I thought that it was valuable, but maybe not. Right. And so having that digital conversation for heat maps and, and those kind of tools is one thing because it's, it's sort of black and white, right? But like if you survey somebody and let's say you just survey a hundred or a thousand people and you get some responses back, how do you best make it such that the responses are digestible? Yeah. How do you make it useful? Right. And that's a question right. that I think over the past few years I've been getting better and better at and learning more and more about. So you remember I said structured conversations and that's the important thing. We don't just talk to people blindly meandering. We have a mission, we have a goal. So there's, there's essentially five things we're trying to understand about these people. And then I'll quickly explain how you make it useful. So the first thing we want to learn is what are their pains and purchase triggers? So what's going on in their life that sends them looking for whatever it is that's on offer? And then the next thing that we want to know, so, so their pain points, the next thing we want to know is their anxieties. What might keep the right person from buying? Not the wrong person. We don't care. Not everyone's going to like your price. Not everyone's going to like your specialty. That's okay. What might keep the right person from buying? So their pains, their anxieties. We want to know what their priorities are. 
So not all pains are the same. Not all benefits are the same. Not all desired outcomes are the same. We want to know what matters most to them and why. And then desired outcomes, as I just mentioned, we want to know what it is they're looking for. Not just what sends them looking, but what benefit they hope to gain, what's in it for them and that kind of thing. And then the fifth one, and this is the one most people I think get wrong, is their awareness level. So if you think about it like this, if, if I wanted to go with you on a trip, I have to, and you came with a suitcase, let's say we were going to Alaska, a cruise to Alaska in the winter, and in your suitcase, there's, there's a towel and some swim trunks. You're not ready to come with me. I've got to help you pack that suitcase with some more things. It's the same in copy, right? What your lead brings with them impacts how they read, what they read, what they're interested in. So easy example is, let's say that you're offering a discount, and you're like $5 off. I can't possibly care about that discount until I understand what's on offer, why it's valuable to me, who it's for, that kind of thing. So awareness level is the fifth. So when we do this research, the first thing is like, let's use a survey as an example. We're using very structured questions, before, during, after type of questions, and we're asking them questions like, what was going on in your life or your business that sent you looking for a solution like ours? You know, what, what else did you try? What didn't you love about it? Uh, during, for the during section that we might ask them, was there anything that surprised you about this product or service? What part of this product service was most valuable to you and why is that? So we ask these qualitative questions. They're not yes, no. And then what we do is we take an aggregate. So I will never analyze on a survey more than 200 questions and to, to be 200 responses, I mean. And, and honestly, after 100, you start seeing diminishing returns because you start to see patterns. And that's what we're looking for is patterns, right? What gets mentioned most? How is it talked about? What language do they use? So when I'm going through these responses or when a conversion copywriter is going through, we're documenting frequency. How often is a theme coming up? But also the language. How are they talking about it? What words are they using? And by doing that, we start to see this sort of roadmap of, okay, these are the most common pains people are dealing with. This is the way they talk about it. These are the, the results they come looking for, and these get mentioned most often, so we should probably talk about the same things. And so it is a lot of manual work, a lot of manual tabulating. My dream and prayer is one day people will get some AI going for this <laughs> that can speed up my job. But it's... It's having that conversation with them and then you take that survey stuff and you go to interviews, you ask the same thing, but the benefit of an interview is you can ask things like why, why is that? Why is that so important? And you can mm. dig a little more. So you have a clear roadmap, a clear plan, you ask about that experience, you capture that data, you tabulate it looking for frequency and language and that starts to paint a picture for, okay, this is what's useful. And you'll learn stuff too. You'll, you'll realize, oh, this benefit that I'm pushing currently, people care about this totally other thing that wasn't even on my radar. Or the people that mm. you think are the decision makers might actually not be the decision makers, right? The people coming to your site might have a chain of command they, they have to go through. So you, you might even learn the buying cycle looks different than you expected. So it's, it's that kind of systematic looking through tabulating, you know, sort of approach that, that makes this stuff valuable and useful and less, you know, conjecture and more, okay, you're pretty clearly getting a signal here that, that these are the things to focus on. Getting to the heart of what it is that you do and why it matters to your potential clients as well as your clients isn't something that you're just going to get off on the back of a phone call. It's just not. Presenting somebody, especially a lead, with your idea for a new website design build or a logo is just not going to make you stand out. It's not going to be unique. You have to be comfortable with talking to and listening to your existing clients as Joel points out here. When I picked up the phone to talk with existing clients when I was at a very pivotal point in my business, where I was just about to hang it all up, I finally was able to see the value that I brought to them each and every single day. And it wasn't what I expected. If you want worksheets, exercises, and the confidence to do this on a regular basis with your clients so that you can then position yourself head and shoulders above everyone else in your space, head on over to feastcourse.com today. As a member, you'll get the processes and templates to not only figure out your ideal client and services that you provide to them, but you're going to learn how to talk to them and figure out a price to put on those services that makes it a complete no brainer for that client. That's why I want to invite you to check out Feast. 
By using the code case study, you can get your first month for just $20. Feast is the community and resource hub for developers and designers ready to get off the project searching hamster wheel and actually run the business that they set out to build. Feast helps position you in the market with what you do, who you help, and helps you build the processes and systems for client management, sales, marketing, delivery, and of course, pricing. Your business is not the same as everyone else's. When you become a Feast member, you get personalized guidance from myself. It is essential for me to meet you where you are and make sure that you are getting the exact tools so that you don't get lost in the shuffle. The moment you sign up, we're going to have a chat so that I can create a custom syllabus, just like a college or university advisor would, of resources within Feast to meet you where you are. If you want to stop chasing down that next project all the time so that you can then start living your life, go to feastcourse.com today and use the code case study at checkout for your first month for just $20. highlighted there mostly like surveys and how to look at that stuff because well that was what I asked you um, but you mentioned in there the interviews and why those could be important and I want to dive a little bit into that a little bit more and I have a feeling naturally that's going to go right into case studies but uh, before we get into that uh, I like to ask a question take a step back what is your defining moment in life so far yeah I think this question is one that, you know, like I, I kind of read it and I thought about it and there've been, there've been a lot of them, right? Like there, there've been defining moments mm-hmm. in like my faith. There've been defining moments in my work, defining moments in my life. But I have to say like the one that's kind of top of mind now, like I'm a, I'm a fairly new dad mm-hmm. and you grow up with this, you know, eventually you start with this view of the world that I think for a lot of people is like fairly like optimistic and bright and you're curious and your brain hasn't been flooded with, you know, dopamine yet. So everything is exciting and new. And I think in time we lose some of that. And so now being a dad and just watching my son as he, like he's in this phase now, he's just curious about everything. And he's so interested in the stuff going on around him and every little thing. And he's pointing to things and curious about stuff. I think in some way that's reignited in me a little bit, just this curiosity and it's translated. I mean, it sounds cheesy way. It's obviously translated to other parts of my life, but when it comes to my work, I think in some ways it's kind of reopened me up to to the idea of like, there's still so much here to, to learn. And for as much as we think we know, or we have great processes for things, there's always something new to explore. So I think for me lately, that's probably a pretty defining moment, but, but there, have, I mean, in everybody's life, there've been many, but that, that's the one I think is freshest for me. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Uh, I am a two time new dad. So nice. we just, <laughs> we just had uh, our second son. Oh, uh, first is two and a half and the second son, well, he's only six weeks old. So mm. um, I totally get what you're saying. It's almost like you're seeing the world through his eyes. And yeah, I mean, even just like, my oldest son, TJ, he was born on December 27th. So he had almost like a full year before he experienced what Christmas was about. And, right. you know, even in the first year at one, he didn't really understand. But this last Christmas, he sort of got it a little bit. He got some of the, you know, like Santa Claus and the decorations and understood presents and all those other kind of things. And when he came down and he saw the presents underneath the tree, like his eyes lit up and it was just like that. See, that's what Christmas is. Like that's what just seeing what a kid, like how a kid experiences things when we go to the aquarium, as simple as like a fish swimming around in a tank is to me, because obviously I'm jaded and (laughs) the world has beaten me down a little bit, but just him, he's like big fish, small fish. I'm like, it's, it's great. Yeah. So I, I totally get that. I totally get that. I know from my, my thing, it's allowed me to open up and be a little bit more empathetic just in the business world. Like as totally. people come to my, you know, into my world, into my business, I'm like, I can almost put myself aside for a minute and just be receptive to who that person is and where they, where they come from. Yeah. I mean, it impacts you. Right. And and that's the thing too, you know, like an example of some of the aquarium, like Linus, he got this book from his grandparents, right. It's got this button you push and it sings this five little monkey song. Well, the first time he pushed it, it scared the hell out of him. Like he, he cried, <laughs> he hated it. 
well, fast forward a day and he won't, it's like a rat with those pellets. He won't stop pushing it. Right. He loves it. But on the empathy thing, I think it's true. I think like my parents always used to say growing up when we talked about people, they say, well, he's, you know, he's somebody's kid. She, she's somebody's daughter. Right. And you kind of, yeah, yeah. You roll your eyes. But I mean, now that I got my own, it's like, yeah, like everybody's somebody's kid and hopefully had parents, <laughs> you know, it just, it changes things. It, it, like yeah. I say, cheese is a sounds a thing for me. It's, it's just shifted some stuff in some good ways. So. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. So let me get back to when you were talking about the survey analysis, and then you mentioned interviews. Mm -hmm. Um, Interviews when it comes to, let's say, case studies, right? Right. And you mentioned like, why is that? Why was that important? Why now? Those why questions. Obviously, those help build up the case study. Mm -hmm. But so many businesses, so many individuals, especially developers, designers, they don't take the time to go ahead and talk to clients at an mm-hmm. interview level. Why do you think that is? And is there any tips or tricks that you can kind of share that says, hey, look, if you do this, just go ahead and this makes this whole process easier? Yeah, I think for the, for the first question, the why, I mean, as a guy who, you know, I've got my own businesses, right? I've got case study buddy and I got my own consulting. I think one of the things is just when you work in the business so much, it's hard to pause and pull back and go and back and talk to people. I think there's that element of we just, we make ourselves busy with the things we think are important in the here and now. I think a lot of us, you know, when there's money to be made or the whole make hay while the sun shines thing, it's, it's really easy to just zero in on doing the work. And I think there's a time for that. But I think another reason people don't do it is fear. I think it's a big one. Fear that they'll say the wrong thing. Fear that they don't know how to do it. Fear of hearing the words no from their clients when they ask if, if they can talk to them. Fear that they'll hear something they don't like. Because if you're having an honest conversation, you will learn things that are not flattering. And, and sure. it hurts in the moment, but it certainly it's important to to keep growing. So I think there's the big one I think is big two are busyness and fear. And I think the first one, the way you get around that is what gets scheduled gets done. And so you put it on your calendar. It doesn't have to be, people tend to, I'll say this quite honestly, people tend to find it addictive. Once you've done one, and it goes well, you want to do more. So it's as simple as, okay, listen, whether it's every week, every other week, you schedule yourself a 15 minute window. You don't need more than that. 15, 20 Mm -hmm. minutes, half hour, whatever. And you say, okay, I'm going to try just each week or every other week to book in one client call and just check in and, and see how stuff's going, see where they're at, see what we're learning. The other thing is making it a part of your process. One of the best times to sit down and have a little interview because the adrenaline's already pumping and they're excited and everything is great is right after signing a client. That's the perfect time to sit down because you have to do some kind of onboarding anyhow. Why not get an interview out of it? So, so that's mm. how I think you tackle the time piece. The fear piece, and this ties into pricing as well, it comes down to process. When you have a process for something and you understand why you do things that way and the value for you and the person on the other end, fear tends to disappear because now it's just procedure. Like, I I know what I'm doing. I'm prepped. I'm ready. I'm, I'm good to go. So one of the simplest processes, some some of the easiest things to to take on are, first of all, the BDA format, before, during, after. Simple, don't ask them any questions that are yes, no, other than is it okay if I record this? Because yes, no questions in a conversation. The second thing is learn to be okay with silence. Most people want to think for a second before they give you a response. The same way you're nervous about asking, they're nervous about answering. You know, they they don't want to screw it up. They don't want to come across like an idiot the same way you don't. So learn to be okay with silence. The third thing is it's okay to ask the same question a different way, a slightly different way. And the reason for that is the same way that sometimes, you know, like I'm sure on a podcast or whatever, sometimes you get asked something a little bit different. You think of something like, oh, I wish I would have said that. Well, if you ask the same question slightly different, it's like giving that person a mulligan. Sometimes you can get a little bit more out of them, a little bit more out of them. And then the next thing I say is just have your stock question set prepped. And, um, you know, I'm happy to share a resource for, for one that, that I've used in the past. But when you have some core questions, then you go in going, okay, I have kind of a roadmap, this BDA format. I got some questions I know I'm going to ask. Now you can calm down, but worry less about reading off a paper like a robotic, you know, automaton and have more of a human conversation. 
And, and this, that's how you start getting some of the value out of, you know, when you really listen and you're not focused on, am I screwing this up? What should I be asking next? When you really listen, that's when you get the opportunity to go, oh, that's interesting. Why is that? Can you tell me more about that? Mm. So I think just having a process going in will help obliterate some of that fear. And then honestly, it's just practice. Your first one's not going to go amazing. If it does, congratulations, you're rare, you know, <laughs> but practice, it, it, you're really just talking to people. There, there's no, you know, no one's like sitting there with a clipboard evaluating your interview skills right off the hop, unless they're truly abysmal, you, you're probably not going to you know, piss somebody off. So it's, it's just a matter of doing it and having a little process behind it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's something that I've, I've done for a long time and I didn't know that people didn't do it. And it was yeah. more of just like, I always had this 15 minute call every quarter with all my clients to kind of just take a temperature and just mm -hmm. kind of, I wanted to ask three questions and it was really just, how's your business doing? Because every business owner loves to talk about their business. So it kind of opens up the conversation a little bit. And then, you know, how can I be doing better? I word it in a way that says, how can it be more awesome? Because that's just you know, my my lingo and how I talk. And the other thing is, this is, what do you like about working together? Right. And for me, as long as I get those two questions answered, anything else on top of that is just gravy. Like those two questions allow me to do learn more about myself and my business and maybe some more opportunities for growth. So there's a couple of things that I want to ask and they kind of could be maybe yes, no questions, but people are often afraid to put case studies on their website, just like they are afraid to put their price on their website. Right. And I've heard similar reasons for why they do that. And for me, it's a little interesting because for me, I don't have a problem putting prices on my website. Mm -hmm. I understand the reasons not to, but I'm curious your thoughts, like, one, have you found that to be true? Like people, hey, why do I need case studies on my website anyway? Right. Like, mm -hmm. and two, if you put case studies, should the case studies align with the pricing? And if so, how does that happen? How can you make that work? Sure. I'll break that down. So the first thing is, I think one of the most underestimated things still today, and, and it's why I love the field I'm in and the work that I'm doing on the case study front, people tend to think of in terms of case studies as only these bottom of the funnel assets where it's like, okay, someone's interested, maybe I'll send them a case study to, to help close the deal. And then that's kind of all they think about it. But when you take a step back, case studies are one of the few, if not the only content assets that you can really use at any stage of your interaction with a customer. Case studies are great for attracting clients. Case studies are great at upselling clients. I've used case studies myself to say, hey, here's someone who was, you know, debating just doing kind of this tier of audit that we we're talking about, but they decided to just splurge a little bit and go to the next year. Here's a case study on all the value that they saw. I'm not gonna sit here and pitch you. Here's someone else basically saying, hey, I made this decision. Here's what I got out of it. Here's the value that you as someone like me is gonna get out of it. So I think, yeah, people maybe have some, some questions like, well, why do I need these in the first place? And to them, I always say like the only thing your competitors can't steal from you. They can steal your pricing. They can copy mm -hmm. your messaging. They can copy your design. They can copy the way you package your services. The one thing nobody can take from you is your proof. Nobody can take from you that soundbite of him saying, I loved working with Jason because he's so communicative and he's so on top of it. And like, no one can take that from you, right? That's a differentiator. And I really do believe we're entering a, a point now where especially whether it's development, whether it's copywriting, whether it's design, whatever it may be, proof is going to be the great differentiator. Have they done it before? Who have they done it for? What did those people have to say? Because we're getting to this point where it's as other countries and other sides of the world develop more and get more proficient and that English barrier comes down, but the cost point stays the same. You know, like we're getting to a point where your proof is going to be what helps you stand out, what helps you close the deal, what, what sets you apart. So that fear I find pretty easy to combat because I can rattle off 10 different ways anyone can use a case study from RFPs to sending out emails as cold outreach to having them as blog posts, having them as guest posts, having them in ads. I can go on and on and on. The, the utility of these things is nuts. On the pricing side of things, remember that I talked about when we were talking about getting ready for an interview, 
when you have a process and you know the value of that process, it's much easier to go do the thing. And the same goes with pricing. When you understand what goes into what you're selling to someone, let's, let's just talk in terms of services in particular, you've got a process for the way you do things and it's valuable for you, but it's also valuable for them. And when you know that process and you can sell the value of that process at every stage, you're more confident charging more. You're more justified in charging more, at least in the eyes of the client. You're like there's confidence and, and there's a differential that comes there. Now you add stories to the mix and what that does is takes the burden of selling the value of that process off of you. So if you've got pricing on your site and, and for my, for what it's worth, I do think you should have, in most cases, pricing on your site, at least like I've done all kinds of experiments with pricing on, you know, for my own services and had some big wins, some big losses. <laughs> but when you've got prices listed, now you can take, whether it's a full case study or just a sound bite from that case study, somebody saying, hey, this was worth every penny and here's why. Case studies become this, this huge justifier for the cost, you know, the, the price you want to charge and not just that, but why you're worth it. When you have these successes behind you, when you have these others advocating for you, now again, it's not the same as you go on Fiverr and hire X amount of, you know, or Upwork, whatever, thousands of developers to do X, Y, Z. Why would I choose you? Well, that's the guy that worked with so-and-so and they were really thrilled and there's a safety and a confidence and a comfort mm -hmm. in that for a customer, for a lead. So, you know, putting those two in tight proximity, they certainly feed off each other and a good case study can absolutely help you upsell or justify what it is you want to charge. Mm. I think it's what you said there is, is kind of how I think about it as well is that the case study, especially if somebody's maybe in the reader's eye, they can align or they're in the same industry or they can relate to the problem or whatever when they read that three sentence. And I want to ask this in a second, but three sentences aligned with the price and saying, hey, look, this was worth every penny. We got 10X on our re return, whatever the, the, the actual sentence says. But then they say, oh, okay, well, this person, I recognize this person or they're in the same space that I am in. I guess it helps them also align their budget accordingly, right? Like, because if they come to the table and let's just say they have $5,000 on the budget, but your prices are 10 and you have three case studies that this person can identify with that all validate the value, the price that you're charging and their return, then they can say, Hey, okay, maybe I need to rethink things. And mm -hmm. it kind of, and it's not just you selling this thing. It's not just you saying, hey, this is why this is worth this. You have that traction of proof from those case studies. The question I, I want to ask you is when you think of case studies, do you think of the full blown out, hey, here was the problem, here's the solution, here's the process, here's the before and afters, here's like the whole thing? Or can a case study be three sentences? I think it's really context specific. And that's why, you know, for, for clients especially, there's many ways to use one story. And we talked about earlier when we were talking about conversion copy and that awareness level, right? And being aware of a customer's context is really mission critical. Like if I'm doing cold outreach, there's no way I'm sending that person a nine page case study because they're never going to read it. Right. Mm -hmm. I need to hook them in. So I'll probably send them something pretty short, pretty tight, pretty condensed. I think, you know, rephrasing case studies, really what we're talking about is customer success stories. That's the heart of it. You're telling a compelling story. Sometimes you tell that story short. Sometimes you tell that story long. There's room for those long case studies. So, I mean, we, like if you have a blog post, you really want to blow at your process. You really want to talk about, you know, the thought and the thinking that went into something. There's room for that. But there's also room on your site to have kind of the teaser, the, the typical, like we have two typical formats. We have a snapshot, we have a narrative. The snapshot is typically, you know, problem, solution, results, one paragraph, you know, basically two, three sentences per section, one quote from the customer per section, that's it. Very quick, very light to read. Great for situations where someone just needs to see the facts, the outcome, that's all they need to see. And then sometimes we'll use that to point to something more in depth that they really want to dig. I think one of the things that is really critical though, and a big mistake a lot of people make 
is we tend to want to have these like magicians aha moments where we like pull back the curtain at the very end and it's like, ta-da, here's what it all added up to. And you have to flip that on its head. You always want to lead with the result. You lead with the big so what. You lead with the big metric or the big quote that you don't have to have metrics to have a great study. You can have, you know, you can have a great study with absolutely no percentages or numbers whatsoever. It's possible. But you want to lead with the big so what. And then whatever situation appropriate, in situations where people are are time starved or they just want the facts, you lead with something kind of light. In situations where that detail is valuable to the consideration process, then you'll have something more in depth. Mm. So sometimes it pays to, to have three different versions of the exact same story and just use them differently as appropriate in the same way that you know, like if, if your house is on fire and you're calling 911, that call's probably going to be pretty short. But you would hope that the analysis of what caused the fire, you'd hope that call be a little bit longer, you know? So right, right. different conversations for different situations. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. So I do want to be mindful of our time here. So before I, I let you go here, you have a free guide that talks about the step-by-steps of mm-hmm. getting a case study. Can you share with us one of those critical steps that we really could benefit from? Yeah, I think, and it's, it's one that people don't think of and it's one of the most missed because people are often just thrilled to get any success story at all. But before you do an ounce of writing, before you pick up the phone to call anyone, before you start scheduling anything, stop and think about your business. And where are you trying to grow? Are you trying to grow into a new market? Are you trying to push a new service? Are you trying to emphasize a certain part of your business or a certain differentiator? Stop and identify yourself. Well, what's the strategy here? What are we, who are we trying to reach? What are we trying to communicate? That should influence who you talk to and which stories you choose to tell. Yes, it's better to have any story than no story. A positive bit of proof doesn't hurt. But it's more valuable and meaningful. Let's say that, you know, you're really trying to say, okay, you know, we're now doing front and back end development, but people only know us as a front end developer. Well, we should get some case studies about our back end work that will help people see and understand the value of having one shop that takes care of both, right? Simple when I say it, seems intuitive. Almost nobody takes that step to stop and think what stories are going to have the most impact for us. Because we don't just want great quotes and great numbers. We want great quotes and great numbers and great results that help us sell or help us reach the right people. Mm. So that I think would be the one that I would mention. And like you say, that guide um, walks through all the different steps, everything from getting buy-in to, you know, how to format it and think about it. But that one, I I would say, is the most overlooked and one of the most valuable and doesn't have to take a long time to do. So have a strategy. Think before you pick up the phone or just act. Yeah, that's super smart. And that was something that I learned the hard way (laughs) because I basically had some, before the iteration of the website that I have now, I had some case studies of theme builds from clients and that I, you know, that I built out and they were great clients and great projects and all that. And, and yet I didn't want to do a theme build anymore. (laughs) Yet people that were coming to my website wanted me to do theme builds. And I'm like, why, why does this keep happening? And I'm like, Oh, how about you take down the stuff there? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, one of the easiest, it's a line someone shared with me in my very first year of going on my own. It's always stuck with me. The work you display is the work you attract. If you don't want to do websites for, for yoga instructors anymore, maybe don't show your profile full of yoga instructor websites. That's, that's what you're going to get more of. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been amazing, Joel. What's up next in the next six, 12 months with you? So, um, I'm kind of in a transitionary period. I think the bulk of my work, my income, my reputation, I think is still on the conversion copywriting side. Um, I've done, you know, I've had some great clients there and I'm certainly going to continue to do that, but I'm slowly dialing that back a bit uh, on the back half of this year. Case study buddy just really uh, we see as blue ocean. There's a lot of opportunity there. And so we've been adding team members, all contractors right now, project manager, another interviewer. uh, And so 
we're really starting now to press into that strategy side and helping clients with that. Uh, we've now rolled out a video offering. Uh, we've rolled out, you know, in the past, all of our output was PDFs. Now we're able to do static pages for people, which is really exciting and, and a lot more utility there. So uh, just continuing to grow case study buddy on that side and, uh, and develop that out. That's going to be my focus kind of for the back half of this year. And I'm excited to see where it goes. Awesome. Yeah. And for you listening, I'm going to link up everything that we mentioned here, especially the free guide, Case Study Buddy, where you can go check out Joel and what he's doing there. Um, Joel's website as well. We'll definitely link up all of those in the show notes. Joel, where can people reach out and say thanks for sharing your wisdom today? Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, LinkedIn, uh, my inbox is always open there. I'm happy to connect with anybody and everybody. You can uh, email me at joel at casestudybuddy.com if you have a specific question. And uh, I can't promise a 24 hour response, but I'll, I'm always, you know, I, I reply to everyone. Sometimes it just takes a bit. And uh, Twitter, I'm super active on Twitter too. So at Joel Kletke um, is, is where you can find me there. And uh, always excited to, to talk to people and just hear what folks are working on and and learn something new, you know, explore from, uh, from a different perspective as well. Yeah. Awesome. Just like our sons. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Joel. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks for having me on. And for everyone listening until next time, it's your time to live in the feast. If you enjoyed today's episode, I can speak for both Joel and myself by saying that we'd love to hear the one takeaway you got from this episode. To be honest with you, my notes, I have a whole bunch. So I'd love to hear the just one. It's really super simple. In the podcast app of choice, presumably this one that you are listening to right now, drop in a comment or a review, or go ahead and share it in a tweet and tag me at res. Also, hit that subscribe button so that you'll be the first to listen in next week when we'll be back with April Dunford, who literally wrote the book on positioning called Obviously Awesome. Until then, it's your time to live in the feast. Mm-hmm.